Well, this morning we'll be reading from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 to 32. And I encourage you, if you have a Bible with you, to, to follow along as we read, as Carl will be referring to this during his talk. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of, of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in your attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still <coughs> angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up in accordance with their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Christians are killjoys. God doesn't want anyone to have any fun. The Bible is just a set of rules and regulations to make your life miserable. You've probably heard the caricatures, but a lot of people actually think that the Christian ethics of the Bible are all about stopping people from having fun. Let me show you a classic example from a few years ago in The Guardian. It was when Mike Baird was Premier of New South Wales, and he also happens to be a committed Christian. But when Mike Baird's government put in place a lockdown to curb alcohol fueled violence in the city of Sydney, the caricatures flowed thick and fast. Who were Sydney's fun police? The author of the article doesn't leave you guessing. Let me read to you from a little further down in the article. Uh, if we go to the next screen... The puritanical policy settings from the New South Wales Liberals are more like pre-First World War Temperance League values, but in 2016, they are put in place by stealth policy measures, firmly pushed by quiet evangelicals such as Bird. And if we skip down to the last paragraph, I think that many voters, such as myself, are right to feel hoodwinked. When I voted, I thought I was voting for the economy. I didn't see the fine print for fundamentalist Christian government next to the tick box. You guessed it, the whole article was firmly against the lockdown laws in Sydney and it kept pushing the same line. It was because the Premier was a Christian that he wanted to lock down Sydney and stop people from having fun. The author said it was not a war on crime, but a war on sin. Is that really what Christianity is all about? Are the Christian ethics of the Bible really all about stopping people from having fun? Because if that is the case, you would have to say that God's commands are anti-social. This issue is important for us to think about today because over these past three weeks, we've been thinking about this issue of disconnection. And if the premise of that article is right and Christian values are actually anti-social and it is all about stopping people from having fun, then how can I argue that reconnecting with God is going to help you reconnect with other humans. As we've been thinking about this problem of disconnection, we saw in talk one that it was not just a COVID problem. We saw that some of the disconnection we feel has come from the way we treat each other. 
And the Bible showed us that the way we treat each other is often motivated by our own selfish desires. Last week in talk two, we saw that our connection problem is not only with each other. Because of the way we've treated each other, we've also now got a connection problem with God. When we hurt each other, we've not only wronged each other, we've also wronged the God who created us and who cares about us and has spoken about how we should treat each other. So our disconnectedness with each other is linked to our disconnectedness with God. But last week, we also saw some good news. God has gone out of his way to reconnect with people like you and me. Because God loves his people, he sent his own son to fix this problem of disconnection. Through Jesus' death on the cross, God now offers forgiveness and reconciliation. Now that forgiveness and reconciliation obviously fixes our disconnect problem with God, but does it offer us anything in terms of our disconnectedness with each other? Can that reconciliation with God actually help us connect better with each other? Or is the Guardian journalist right? Does reconnecting with God mean joining the fun police and becoming antisocial and more disconnected from the people around us. Let's have a look at another helpful passage from the Bible. We're at point one, beliefs and behavior. And if you have that Bible passage that was read to us a moment ago open, that'd be fantastic. We'll put it on the screen as well. Let me read to you from the start of that passage again. From chapter four, verses 17 to 19. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. You probably know that the term Gentile is used to describe anyone who isn't Jewish. Now, this letter that we're looking at today, it was written to Christian people, followers of Jesus, who lived in Ephesus. That is in the area that we now call Turkey. So I want you not to get offended by Paul's language here because most of the people that he is writing to have been Gentiles before they put their trust in Jesus. Now what is Paul saying about Gentiles? Well, in pretty stark language, Paul is saying that their beliefs shape their behavior. That's fairly, a, a fairly uncontroversial fact that your beliefs shape your behavior. In business, on the sporting field, at home, everywhere, your actions are shaped by what you believe. We're seeing it right now in the vaccine rollout, aren't we? If you don't believe that COVID is real, you won't be lining up for a vaccine. If you believe that taking the vaccine is less risky than contracting COVID, you probably will be lining up for the vaccine. It's fairly uncontroversial to say that a person's beliefs shape their behavior. And as the Jewish people throughout history looked at the Gentile nations around them, they saw actions that demonstrated a lack of understanding about the true God. So, for example, they looked at the Canaanites who worshipped a God called Moloch, and they watched the horrific religious practice of child sacrifice to appease Moloch, and they said, these people don't know the true God. That's the logic in these verses. If you don't know the true God, your actions won't be shaped by his commands. If you're in the dark about God, that darkness will shape your behavior. But then these verses hold out the promise of light in terms of knowing God and living differently. Let's pick it up in verse 20, verses 20 to 24. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Here is the possibility of change for anyone who's been living in the dark about God. And it all starts with hearing about Christ. That is step one to a relationship with Jesus, isn't it? Hearing about Jesus. Now we talked last week about the gospel. 
which is the important facts about Jesus, his creation of us, our rebellion against him, the judgment that we deserve for that rebellion, his death in our place to take that judgment, his resurrection as king and judge, and the opportunity for you and me in him to have forgiveness and to be reconciled with God. They are the important facts about Jesus that we need to hear in order to trust in Jesus and be saved by Jesus. It's through hearing those important facts from the Bible that we can believe in Jesus and have true reconciliation with God. These verses promise that coming to know Jesus can change your life. The language is beautiful, isn't it? You can put off your old way of life with all the old actions and attitudes. And you can put on a whole new way of life that is shaped by God's beautiful values of righteousness and holiness. Does that sound like something that you would like to do? Would you like that kind of fresh start in your life? We're going to drill down a little bit more into this life change. So we're at point two, Jesus changes lives. God transforms lives first and foremost through the death of Jesus, through the cross. What Jesus did for us at the cross is the life-changing power of Christianity. So please make sure you get that right. It's not that you and I might somehow get our behavior together and then God might be happy enough to save us. That is not true Christianity. The true facts about Jesus are that God saves people through nothing else except Jesus' death in their place upon the cross. So it is not that behavior change leads to salvation. It is that salvation leads to behavior change. So let's have a look at some of that behavior change that Jesus could bring about in your life. Let's read verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. How important is truth in a relationship? Sadly, you and I already know how important truth is in a relationship from hard personal experience of the opposite. You know how much damage lies can do to a relationship. So if a relationship with Jesus can help someone change from living by lies to speaking the truth do you think that would be antisocial or perhaps social but of course you could spin it the other way couldn't you god is demanding that i don't lie anymore what a killjoy how am i going to have any fun if i can't lie what right have the fun police to stop me from lying truth or falsehood what would you like from the people that you are connected with? And what do you think they would like from you? Look at what else a relationship with Jesus can help you with. Have a look at verse 26. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. You probably know what unrestrained anger can do to a relationship. And again, if God helps his people to control their anger more appropriately and deal with it more appropriately, is that antisocial or social? Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Why that command? The goal is reconciliation, isn't it? Rather than letting anger fester and damage relationships, God has shown us that reconciliation is a much better alternative. In fact, God has shown us how to reconcile anger by the way that he has reconciled with us. God has shown us how good it is when relationships can be reconciled through repentance and forgiveness. The pattern continues in verse 28. Have a look. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. It's the same again, isn't it? When God saves people through Jesus, he desires that they stop their antisocial behavior and start more social behavior. It's pretty clear that stealing from people is antisocial. And generously sharing with people is about the most social thing you could possibly do. 
Can you imagine what a change this would work in any relationship? In the last year, you might have followed the Melissa Caddick tragedy. It appears that through lies and deception, Melissa Caddick had stolen up to $25 million from her friends and even from her family. Fun fact, Melissa Caddick attended both my primary school and my high school in the year above me. See, um, there's a quality public education for you. I'm sure you can imagine the life skills that Melissa and I learnt at those great public schools. And isn't that the best primary school, school uniform you have ever seen? Every single boy is the yellow wiggle. But all joking aside, whatever happened to Melissa was a tragic end to a life that had gotten out of control on lies and theft. Can you see that lies and theft are the kind of antisocial behaviours that can destroy relationships and destroy lives? And the passage continues again with the same pattern. Next, it's what the Bible calls unwholesome talk. Have a look at verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. We can be pretty antisocial in the way that we speak to other people and the way we speak, perhaps more likely, about other people when they're not around. God changes lives through Jesus so that we can speak differently. Speaking words that build people up rather than tearing people down. Then as we get near the end of our passage, there's a whole list of disconnecting behavior that God's saved people can put off and replace with a whole list of behavior that builds good connections in relationships. Let's have a look at them, verses 31 and 32. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. So you need to make the call. Is God just about stopping you from having fun? Is God antisocial? Is God just trying to make your life miserable? Or is God actually able to help you build real strong connections with others through the life-changing salvation that he is offering you. Now, just before we move on to our last point today, there are two very interesting verses that we've rushed over quickly. Let me read them to you. They're very interesting. Firstly, verses 26 and 27. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. And down at verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. What we have here is two very powerful influences on our lives. The devil wants evil and more antisocial behavior. You and I can give him more of an opportunity in our lives by simply living out that antisocial behavior that he loves. Or we can seek to live by the desires of God's Holy Spirit. Now, you can understand why, the, why God's Spirit would be grieved by those antisocial behaviors in the life of someone who's been saved by Jesus. But can you also imagine how much God's Spirit loves to help us to live out those behaviors and encourage those good relationships and promote reconciliation? So I guess my question to you is, whose influence do you want in your life? We're at point three. Can Jesus change your life? The bottom line is this, Jesus changes lives and it all starts with God's forgiveness. That fact is driven home by the last verse in our passage. Can I take you there again? Verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. God forgives people like you and me who trust in Jesus and God offers this forgiveness freely because Jesus already paid the price through death on a cross. 
A changed life starts with God's forgiveness, which allows reconciliation and relationship with the God who made us. But did you see where that last verse takes this? If God has shown us forgiveness, then we can learn from him and forgive others. We can pass it on. We can pay it forward. Call it whatever you want. But make sure you see that God gives forgiveness to us first so that we can then follow him and give forgiveness to others. But you don't need this forgiveness if you would prefer to keep fighting. If you would rather keep fighting it out with God and fighting it out with everyone else in your life, then forgiveness is useless to you. Forgiveness is only for people who want to end the fighting. Through Jesus, you can stop the fighting with God. And then through Jesus, you can work on the fighting in all of those other hard relationships in your life. Forgiveness really is beautiful because it can end the fight. So, what do you want to be? What kind of human do you want to be? You can keep accusing God and Christians of being antisocial. You can keep arguing that, that God's wisdom just kills all the fun in life. You can keep pretending that God is antisocial, that God is just a killjoy. But I suspect you might have seen through that argument a little bit today. And I wonder whether you've seen today that God actually cares about good relationships and is keen to make good social relationships happen. God has gone out of his way to offer reconciliation to us through the beautiful forgiveness that he's obtained for us. And then that forgiveness and God's wise commands can start changing the way we connect with each other, one relationship at a time. God is not antisocial towards you, but you may be being antisocial towards God. If you want to change that, God would love you to accept his offer of forgiveness. You don't need to stay in the dark about God. You don't need to stay away from his forgiveness. So I want to encourage you as we, as we finish up these three weeks of, of talks on connection, disconnection, I want to encourage you not to stop here. I want to encourage you to explore this area a bit more. See, I don't want you to make a rush decision about Jesus. And that is why this church offers this great course, the Share Life course, which is so helpful for thinking further about these important things. The Share Life course allows you firstly to connect with other people who also want to explore this area of faith and life, but then allows you to explore Jesus and the change he can make in your life. I want to encourage you not to die wondering on this one. It is so worth investing just a few hours in this course to look into the facts that we've talked about and to check Jesus out for yourself. In a minute, you'll have a chance to say hi and to let us know that you're interested. But I'm going to finish by praying about these things. Please pray with me. Our Father God, we are sorry for the unhelpful ways we have treated you and many of the people we love. Thank you for not leaving us in the mess of our disconnected lives. Thank you for offering us reconciliation by sending Jesus to die for our forgiveness. Please help us to respond the right way to what Jesus has done for us. And please continue to teach us about those beautiful actions that strengthen relationships and promote peace. And we pray this through Jesus, our only Saviour. Amen. Well, Carl, thank you for uh, talking to us from God's Word and opening that up for us and explaining uh, really those uh, foundational things about Jesus and how it uh, helps us uh, have those restored relationships. And that comes through forgiveness. There's, there's been lots of questions that have have come through, and we're not going to be able to get to all of them at this point, but there'll be an opportunity for an extended uh, Q&A uh, during the week, so keep your eyes out for that. But um, coming through on the Slido for this week, um, one person asked this, and I think this is a question many people are, are asking, is that, that, that they don't like intervening mm. in, in someone else's life, you know, uh, particularly someone who's got different beliefs to them. Mm. Isn't it better just to let them be, 
Or, if not, where do you draw the line on that? Yeah, that's a really helpful question. Um, let's push it to its, its, its furthest extent. Can we talk about anything we, we disagree about, or do we just need to go along our own lives and never interact on anything? Because if we're going to disagree about lots of things, I'm not, I'm not on about forcing or you know, t telling people what they've got to do, but I think it's loving to people to chat about things that really matter. So the people I care about, I want to talk to them about important things. Um, can we, I think we've become really bad at this, being able to talk and disagree, but really enjoy doing it with intellectual honesty and beneficially for both of us. Can we disagree without being disagreeable? Do we have to take our stand and throw rocks at each other from a distance? Can't we actually chat about things that matter, even when we disagree? Yeah, it's that difficulty, isn't it, when you start uh, chatting about things that uh, go so core to someone's personality or, or what they, how they identify themselves that uh, it can become difficult. So how do we do that lovingly yeah, yeah. is a great challenge for us. Um, uh, second question, uh, we talked a lot about the 50% the pass mark. Mm. Um, and uh, how, can we, how can we talk about that without sort of sounding judgmental? And how can this conversation move to a life-giving moment? Yes, okay, this is really good. Perhaps you could be on a couch in front of a lot of church people and have to admit that you're arrested uh, for shoplifting, perhaps. Uh, no, there's a serious answer here, and that is that um, we've all failed in this area. My failure may have been a little bit more, um, you know, uh, kind of well-known and a little bit more spectacular, but I guess the way to talk to other people about it is to admit your own failure in that area and to, to say none of us can achieve God's standard behaviourally. And that, that is why we all need forgiveness. So I take it if you can admit to that yourself, you'd be very helpful to others as you talk to them about it. Yeah, and then maybe, it, maybe our, our schooling as well, like just that 50% is the pass mark, yeah. has sort of playing into our thinking there where actually God's pass mark is 100%. Yeah, that's right. That, uh, I was we... completely wrong when <laughs> I thought it was 50%. And just to clear it up, you're not down on public schools, are you? No, I'm being self-deprecating. Please forgive me. Um, I actually love the two schools I grew up with, beautiful little schools in the, the south of Sydney. Um, but in a sense, school can only teach you so much about life. No matter what school you go to, you, you can't, it can't teach you how to, uh, how to do life well with God. And so that's where forgiveness is the key that you need. And, and this last question is, is quite a personal question. And the, the person asks, I, I agree beliefs are relevant to behavior, but I remain weak. And it's not simple to just put on a new, beautiful, righteous self. Have you got any, yeah. anything that you can encourage yeah, you and me both, and that is why, isn't it great, that uh, God doesn't change us overnight. God saves us overnight. The moment you put your trust in Jesus, you've gone from death to life, uh, unforgiven to forgiven. But as you kind of learn to follow Jesus, he works in you by that Holy Spirit we talked about to grow you in that, that, those beautiful things that um, we saw in Jesus and which he wants to bring about in your life to make you the kind of person that... Others will love relating to in relationship. So it's, it's actually it's a, it's a, a whole-of-life journey with Jesus. Um, it, it won't, uh, you, you'll, it's a growth pattern with Jesus over the whole of your life. Keep praying that God keeps changing you. Yes, and it is. It is constant. You don't, you don't go, go from zero to 100 straight away. It's, yeah. it's a constant uh, growth over a long period of time. Well, Carl, I want to thank you for joining us Pleasure. over these uh, last three weeks and uh, opening up God's Word and uh, challenging us and, and pointing us to the hope that is found in Jesus. So thank you very much for that. And we look forward to answering some more questions uh, throughout the week. But I want to encourage uh, everybody, uh, everybody here to... Uh, if you haven't already, to uh, log on and sign up for the Share Life course. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to ask these questions, to talk about these topics, to, to really engage with other people. And, and I remember when I was doing these courses, and I've done many of them, there's this beautiful community that exists as we have our Bibles open, and people are asking honest questions about life as they want to engage in these topics. So if you're sort of on the fence about whether you want to sign up for a Share Life course, I encourage you just do it. Uh, join the community. Uh, bring your questions. There's no question that is off limits and have a great discussion with uh, people who want to explore similar topics.